Yeah, so this, as I said before, this is a recreation of um, one of the, the labs at uh, Teachers College. <clears throat> this was made over the summer by one of uh, the doctoral students there. So another thing also is that a room that you create in Mozilla Hubs will stay open for as long as um, until you until some the, one of the administrators actually goes in and closes it. So if you create a room and a bunch of people go in and you know you do a bunch of activities there and they leave a whole bunch of like you know images or drawings or other things like that, if you then leave and come back, it'll all still be there until somebody actually closes it out and then it'll wipe out everything. Um, so that's a good way if you want to have stuff persist over a period of days or weeks or months um, that you can do that. <clears throat> uh, one of the things also you can do, so normally the way you move in the, the scene is usually using uh, WASD keys or by using the arrow keys. Um, but if you're on a desktop, you can also right click and that will activate um, teleportability, which will automatically jump you to different spots. Um, we'll see when we go into spoke that there are ways to create waypoints. So this allows people to easily teleport from one part of the map to another. <clears throat> Um, one of the things that I really like about hubs um, that I think makes it a better experience if you have a large number of people than, say, Zoom, is the fact that um, audio is based on your proximity to other people in the room with you. So it gives it a much more realistic feel, like actually being in a room. Um, and so that way, you can have a couple people who are kind of clustered together talking to each other, and then another people who are clustered talking to each other, which can be kind of a mess in Zoom if you you know, say give a talk or something like that. And you say, okay, everybody, you know, it's coffee hour now, go talk amongst yourselves. And you have 50 people who are all talking <laughs> at the same time. It's it's kind of a cacophony, but this is nice because it everybody's able to sort of break off into their own little groups and you don't have to actually create individual breakout rooms, which is sometimes something that a host on a Zoom call will have to do. And it gets a little, a little tedious and a little fiddly to do that. <clears throat> Um, I also created a PowerPoint that it's not, I mean, it's, it's not really a presentation. It's more just a set of links. Um, but this has some of the, the links to stuff that we'll be using. It also has some useful um, tools that you can access later. Do we have any questions at this point? <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, jump into hubs then. So I'm gonna close out of the, oh, I'm sorry, that I, I'm gonna close out of the hubs room and switch it over to spoke. So for using spoke, you, um, don't actually have to have uh, an account, but it will definitely help because if you have an account, you can then upload um, your own content. Um, any if you decide not to create an account or if you you know just decide to link to content that is being hosted on other services, just keep in mind that um, it may be a little slower. So that's why they always recommend that you upload any videos or models that you're going to be using or, or images, upload it directly to hubs. <clears throat> so to get started, it's very simple. So you just go in and you just create a new project. Now they have a whole bunch of different projects that you can choose from as an option. Um, and there are more coming out all the time because one of the nice things about hubs is that if you 
select the option, you can make whatever project you're working on available for other people to, to download themselves and to remix and repurpose. So they have a whole bunch of their own, but they also have stuff that was made by other users. Um, this one here, this uh, Hub School, it's getting a lot of attention because it's pretty pretty neat, uses a lot of the different features. Um, <clears throat> so we'll just go in and just create a, a new empty project here. Um, and so then this drops us into, into the world. It actually isn't a completely empty project. They give you this sort of default uh, terrain to work with here. Um, you can just delete that. Um, so if you did not sign in and just and just went in without actually creating an account, um, this My Assets feature here will not be in there. Um, but they still give you a very wide range of different uh, tools that you can use with different 3D models. Um, so let's go into a little bit about the interface. So the main place we are going to be looking at your projects that you're creating is going to be this viewport here. Um, <clears throat> so just a quick bit about working with, with 3D uh, environments. There's going to be three different axes that you're working on. There's the X axis, the, the axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis. Um, and so, you know, that basically corresponds to, to the three dimensions. <clears throat> and so for any object in the world, so if you see up here, there's something called translate, which this just means that you can move the object in 3D space. You can also move it up if you want. Um, and Control Z uh, will, will work for undo, just like with a lot of other programs. Um, next to that, you'll see rotate. If you click on that, it will change the interface here. So now it's circles, so they can actually just rotate the object that you want. I'll zoom in a little bit, so it's a little clearer. And you know you can click and rotate on each of the different axes. Um, and then the other one is scale. So with scale, uh, it's basically just increasing or decreasing the size of the object. Um, if you click on this middle box here, it will increase everything at the same ratio. If you click on any one of the axes, it will increase it only along that axis. <clears throat> um, another really important part of the interface here is what's called the hierarchy, which is over here on the right side. So each time you add a new object into the world, um, so let's just grab something and just chuck it in there. Um, you'll see that it adds it into the hierarchy here. Um, so the hierarchy is a really great way if you start having a lot of objects in your scene to really organize those objects and um, to be able to access the things uh, in your scene. So you can click on an object in the scene like this, or you can just click on that same object in the hierarchy. And so that's a, a pretty good way to do things. Uh, you can also rename objects in the hierarchy. So let's just say you have a whole bunch of different images that you've added to your scene. You know, you can change the names on those. So that way it's a little easier to understand what you're looking at. <clears throat> um, you can also duplicate an object from the hierarchy as well. Um, so if you wanted to say clone this, this thing here, and now we've got two of them in the scene here. Um, you can also group objects together. So you can create a group and then, you know, say if we want these two things to be together in the same group, and then we can also rename the group to whatever we want. <clears throat> so it's a really good way to keep all of your stuff nice and organized. Um, below the hierarchy panel here, we have what's called the properties panel. So this is going to be the properties for each of your specific items. Um, so let's just grab something real quick. Let's do like an image and drag that into our scene. Um, so here we have the dimensions of the image. So it's position in space, it's rotation, it's scale. Um, so if you didn't want to actually manually do it over here in the viewport, you can also mess with these, these uh, numbers over here and change those values. Um, this here, this little link will change whether or not it's uniform. So if I have it um, checked, if I change this to five, all the dimensions will change to five. If I unlink it, 
then I can just change only that one dimension. Um, and below that, you'll see now, um, this is what controls uh, what image is actually going to be displayed. So this is the image URL here. Um, <clears throat> you can also set the transparency mode. So if you're using a PNG file, for example, where you might have a transparent background, um, you can set here um, how you want that to appear. And then this button here also will check or uncheck if the object is going to be visible or not in the scene. Um, I don't know exactly why. I mean, I guess the visibility you might want to check off as you're working on stuff. If there's things that you're trying to work on without it being obscured by something else, you might want to check it off. I don't know why you'd want to leave it unchecked in your published scene, but you know, who knows? There might be a reason. <clears throat> <clears throat> Any questions so far? The, yeah, two questions. The, is there a classic undo if you're making a change and you can control Z and something like that? Uh, probably. I don't know. I always use just use control Z. Um, okay. Or it would be Command Z on a Mac. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the other one was the spawn point. Is that where the, the people entering the space would, would show up? Yes. Yes. So I'll, yeah, I'll go over each of the different elements. Um, <clears throat> so yeah. So the model. So like this group here. It's just like if you're if you have a bunch of multiple objects together, um, you can use that group tool. Um, the model. If you're clicking and dragging something in this right now just sort of has a very uh, a default model that it puts in um, which is this rubber ducky it's a little hard to see there we go okay <clears throat> um yeah so so if you're uploading your own assets you can just grab them you can just import them over here there's an upload option so you can click on that and then upload your own files um but you can also if you want um, just put in a link down over here in the properties panel to the, the URL of the model. Um, but there's also a lot of really great assets that they already have available to you, um, including this architecture kit, which actually allows you to build your own rooms if you want to. <clears throat> That's taking a minute to load there. Um, so the architecture kit is really there it is okay. The architecture kit is really useful for building a room. Um, the only thing I would caution you about is that you should probably try to keep the room um, fairly simple to use. Oh, and uh, uh, another thing also is the to actually move around inside the viewport. So if you left click, that is going to allow you to sort of swivel around a center point. If you right click. That will rotate the the camera that you're using. It gives you a slightly different experience. Um, if you use a scroll wheel, or if you um, use two fingers of using a touchpad, it will zoom in and out. If you hold down, it will allow you to pan around the scene. Yeah, so the construction kit, the architecture kit is, is pretty handy. Um, I would just keep the scene relatively simple though, because one of the disadvantages to using a modular system like the architecture kit is that it does create more geometry than you need, which um, if the scene starts to become very, very complex is going to create performance issues. And, and so people who are using lower end um, devices might start to struggle with that. <clears throat> um, but it is a very, a very handy way to quickly add in um, pieces.
So let's go back to the other elements here. Um, so you can very, I'm actually going to um, I'm actually going to get rid of this terrain here. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so if you click on the ground plane option, that will just add in a nice flat area for you to build on. Um, there's also several different types of lighting here. So there's ambient lighting, which um, is basically going to act almost like sunlight. It's going to illuminate everything in the scene. <clears throat> um, there's also directional light, which is going to be a bit more like a spotlight. And if you if you go down here, it will show you the different options you can use for setting the different types of lighting. So you can change the colors, you can change the intensity of the light, you can check whether or not it casts a shadow. That might be useful if you're finding that there's um, some performance issues. Checking off that cast shadow just requires a little less um, processing power from, the, from your machine. Um, <clears throat> you can also set the resolution of the shadow, so you can turn that up or down depending on um, how detailed you want it to be, but keep in mind that the more you increase that, the more processing power it's going to demand. Um, and you can mess around with like some of the, the details about the shadows. So directional lighting can be very useful if you're trying to create something a little more atmospheric, um, but otherwise ambient lighting is usually going to be perfectly fine. Yeah, and the ambient lighting has much fewer options here. You're basically just setting a color and just an intensity. <clears throat> uh, hemisphere light, I don't really use hemisphere light um, that much, but yeah, it's also like kind of a, a like a bright day type of light. <clears throat> um, so then you also have the spotlight as well, point light. Um, so point light would be something where it's actually going to be, you might want to use this for like a lamp or like a candle or something like that. So it's going to be a single point of light, but it's going to shoot out in all directions. <clears throat> um, in each of your scenes, you're also going to have want to have some sort of spawn point. You can have as many spawn points as you want. Um, this is going to be the place where people jump into your scene. Um, so once they've actually picked their avatar and set that all that up and their, their username, um, the spawn points will determine where uh, they're going to be coming into the scene. <clears throat> um, and so you can set those to be visible or invisible. Usually you probably want to set it to be invisible. Um, the waypoints are, as I uh, said before, there you can use those to kind of teleport from one spot to another. Um, so if there's places that maybe you only want to be accessible from certain directions or something like that, you can use um, you can use the waypoints to do that. Uh, waypoints can also function as spawn points. So if you see down here, you can check off uh, the spawn point. You can also check off here whether or not someone can actually stand on that spot. You can check here if you want the waypoint to be a clickable object inside the world so that where people can jump to it. So those are pretty handy. One of the um, the Mozilla Classroom example from earlier, it actually uses each one of the student seats. It's a waypoint, so if the student click on that seat, they'll, their avatar will actually sit down in the seat. So that is one way you can potentially use that. Can use it to make create uh, different types of chairs and seating in, in your spaces. Uh, so the image, yeah, you know, I showed you guys the image before. Video, so you can include video into your projects here. Um, this can be so you can just include a, a link here. So YouTube videos will work just fine. Vimeo and things like that. Um, if you want to include those into your scene. And then there's some some options here, so you can set it so that uh, you know whether if you want it to loop or you want it to play automatically, you can you can adjust that. Otherwise, the users will have to actually go in and manually click to start the video. Um, I haven't actually tried doing any like streaming video, so I don't really know if that would work. But that could be one way 
<clears throat> to potentially have more people inside your, your hub rooms. Because one of the things is you're gonna be limited to about 24 people before you're gonna start to experience uh, problems with the performance. So one thing you can do is you can create different instances of the same room. So for example, if you, um, you have a guest speaker coming and you want it to have an auditorium, right? And so you could make it so that you just have five different instances of that auditorium running and then the video would be streaming to all of them at the same time. That might be one way you would get around that. So you could have as many people as you want in those spaces. Um, but I haven't actually tried that myself. So it's possible there could be a lot of latency and it could be sluggish. Um, so I don't really know if that, that would necessarily be the best solution for that, but certainly something to try if, you, if that's what you're gonna be looking for. <clears throat> um, there are also settings here for the sound as well. So this, this gets to be a little bit difficult to, to sort of figure out what the sweet spot is that's really gonna depend on um, the size of your space, it's going to depend on the number of people that you're expecting. Um, but so for example, though the volume, you know, it's pretty straightforward, it just means what the volume is going to be when you're standing right next to the video. Um, but then there's also going to be uh, a fall off from that. So the farther away you get from where the video is set up, the softer and softer it's going to be. And so, you know, these settings here will determine how much it's going to to fall off as you move away from it. And then the max distance will set, at what point can you no longer hear the video at all? Um, and that's just as true also for audio sources as well. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you would just include a link to the audio or if you're uploading your own audio, you can, you can do that from your assets. Um, and again, it's gonna have a max distance and a roll, and a roll off as well. Um, Spawner is going to be an interactable object for your users where they'll be able to actually um, spawn new objects into the world. So this is good if you have, you know, if you're doing something with students, for example, and you want them to be able to play around with different objects in the world, you can use the Spawner tool um, to create different types of objects. Um, but it gives you a little more control over what objects they're actually going to be putting out there. <clears throat> so when you actually create it here, there's um, a URL where you can uh, put in the, the type of model that you're going to be bringing in to the, to the scene. So all, I should also note also that all of the models, if you're going to be using your own custom models, have to be in a GLTF format, um, which is, stands for Graphics Language trans, uh, is it Transform, or, yeah, Transform Format. Um, so if you're using if you're using something maybe a model that you got off the internet and it's not in that format, um, there are online uh, places where you can convert it. I included a link to one of those in the the presentation at the end. There you can uh, the first link in the the 3D model resources will allow you to convert any model type into the GLTF format. If you're using something like Tinkercad or Blender, they actually natively have the ability to export as a GLTF uh, model. So that's that's very helpful. Um, but that's kind of becoming the standard for any sort of um, web 3D modeling is gonna be using that, that file format. And then we have also link here. So link is, is a little misleading because um, you might think with link that this is creating a link to um, an outside website and then maybe it would like open up a tab or something like that. But actually what link is referring to is linking to another hub scene. Um, so you would include the URL here for the hubs room that, I guess you, yeah, if you try to do with a website, it may work, but really it's intended for connecting to different hubs rooms. I remember we had some issues where we tried to use it for a website and it didn't, didn't work, but there are some websites that it might it might open up another tab for, but mostly you're just gonna be using it to create connections between different hub rooms. Um, so keep in mind, if you're gonna do that, you the hub room has to actually exist already. So it's not, you're not connecting between two different scenes, you're connecting between two different instances of a scene. Um, so 
when you actually create a Mozilla Hubs room, you'll be able to choose the, the, um, the URL that you want to use for that room. So you can just copy and paste that directly into there. And then when people click on that, so you can put it like put the link on a door, for example. Um, and then once they click on that door, then they'll be transported over to the new, the new room. So as I said before, if you wanted to create sort of a hub room and have all these different offshoot rooms that you wanted people to be able to go into, this link option is how you would be able to connect those different rooms together. Um, we also have a particle emitter. So basically what this is, is it's it sort of creates clouds or fountains or, um, you know, sparklers. Um, and so you have a whole bunch of different options here that you can play with for those. You can, you know, you know, if you want it to, it to be more of a, a fountain and come out blue, you could change it to that. If you wanted it to be like fire, you could change it to red. And now it has a little bit more of a fire effect to it. <clears throat> so that's pretty handy. Um, keep in mind, it is a little more resource intensive. So I would definitely use particle systems sparingly. The more particle systems that you have in the scene, the more difficult it's going to be for people um, using less powerful devices. Um, and you also have the ability to add in water as well. So this is a sort of a water plane. Scale this up. Yeah, so if you think you want to have water inside your scene, you can do that as well. Um, so this, the last thing here, or one of the last things here is the scene preview camera. So what this is actually going to do is it's going to create a new camera in your scene that is pretty much going to be used exclusively for the lobby. So when people are waiting to get in, they'll, this is the camera that they're going to use um, for their scene. Um, it's also going to be used for the thumbnail. So if you, um, you know, you have like a list of, of scenes available, this scene preview camera is going to show um, wherever you position the camera, that is what you'll see in the thumbnail for that scene. <clears throat> And the media frame, I haven't really messed around with media frame. I'm not exactly sure uh, what that one is used for, frame to capture media objects. I don't really know. I haven't, I haven't really played around with that one too much. <clears throat> so do we have any questions so far about anything that I've gone over? I'm actually going to go back out and then I'm going to use one of the existing projects to show you how you can modify. So let's like take this one, for example. Actually, yeah, I do have one question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, any tips for placements? Like if you want to, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's not that easy to navigate. In the viewport, and so if I want two things to be close to each other, or like, are there ways to um, use the coordinates, or like I have something I want to line it up with another object? How like how could I read the coordinates of something? I guess so that I can move something. Like I want to put the emitter under an object so that, like you said, there's a there's a fountain effect or something. Mm -hmm. um, any tricks for that for someone who's not proficient with working in this kind of editor? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, again, so there are two ways to, to move something within the scene. You can either use the transform up here, which will allow you to move it along the different axes if you click and, and drag and like that. Um, and then there's the positions in the properties. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of just a, 
you know, a little bit of a trial and error process in terms of actually lining things up exactly the way you want. Um, let's actually see if we can find something in assets here for fountains. That's a fair answer. I was looking for some magic, but I get practice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and so it's nice that they have all of this stuff kind of already, you know, all of these scenes that you can just sort of grab right away. So that way you don't necessarily have to start from scratch each time. Um, so you can look around at different scenes and say, okay, this is actually 90% of the way there for what I want. And I just kind of want to add a little, you know, a little thing here, a little thing there. Um, so that can also be very handy as well that you can just kind of easily grab something that is pretty much what you want and you just want to be able to add um, just a little extra flair. The other thing too, is that if you don't want to really mess with spoke at all, you can just go into Mozilla hubs and just see if there's a scene that's already has all the stuff that you need and just, just, just launch that scene. You can just automatically create that into a room and then just send the link out, links out to everybody and you're good to go. You know, so you don't actually have to create a custom experience from scratch each time. Um, you can just, just use something that's already out there. <clears throat> Yeah, and they also have a whole bunch of different sounds that you can also just drag into the scene as well. Um, again, the sounds are going to be one of those things that starts to become an issue with, in terms of processing power. So actually, interestingly enough, apparently what causes the biggest issue for adding more and more users into the scene is actually the mics, all of the different mics going together and then having to share that information across all the different users. That's where things really start to slow down. Um, <clears throat> So, so again, it's, it's a question of like trying to figure out how to keep all those elements in check. When you eventually do publish your scene, uh, there'll be a publish to hubs option here, and it will show you kind of what you can expect in terms of, I think it's here, in terms of the, the performance. I think it's here. Yes, okay. So right, so here it'll show you how many polygons do you have in the scene. So each object is going to be made up of a certain number of polygons. The more complex that object is, the more polygons are going to be in it. Um, and so they recommend no more than 50,000 triangles um, for mobile devices. That's the point where things start to get a little bit crazy. Um, <clears throat> they also recommend not using a ton of different materials. So materials are gonna basically be the, the textures that are on your objects. They recommend keeping those fairly low, down to 12 unique materials. Um, you know, they have, they would recommend using fewer lights because um, again, all that's going to be stuff that is going to have to be processed at runtime. And so I want to try to keep those things relatively low. If you know that you're going to be working with a bunch of people who are having, using higher end machines, you can definitely up these numbers here, or if you know you're going to be working with fewer people. Um, I saw one of the examples that is in actually one of the videos that I linked to is um, a 3D scan of an ancient temple and like an actual real temple. And so the graphics on that are actually pretty photorealistic and it's incredible, but it also means that you want at most 10 people into that scene using better computers before you really start to have problems. <clears throat> but yes, this is handy. As you're publishing it, it will show you kind of how your scene is expected to perform. So this one is a very simple scene. So, you know, everything's low here. There's not really a lot of issues. Yeah, so, and Mozilla has a, a nice setup with, with uh, Sketchfab, so a lot of their, uh, in Google Poly, so a lot of their stuff gets pulled in that you can just, just, you know, click and drag into a scene right away. Also, these things will be available for your users as well. So if you are using a, if you have allowed your users to be able to add their own 3D models into the scene, they can just go in and, and pull from these online lab libraries and drop those into your scene as well. Um, if you don't want your users to be able to do that, then you can also restrict their access to that too. <clears throat> I 
yeah, so some of these objects here, you can kind of see like, like this cockpit here, this is very detailed. That one's gonna probably start to run into some, some, some issues. This one's also got a lot of detail. So these are gonna be things that if you add those into your scene, you're gonna start seeing um, some performance problems, you know, just beyond a certain point. <clears throat> Yeah, this one, this one is also pretty detailed as well. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Oh, you got a question? Yeah. So other than um, say like using the architecture kit to build rooms, this mm -hmm. platform like isn't really meant to like make models. And stuff. Like all this stuff that I'm seeing in this current scene that you have, it would have been like an uploaded model. Is that the case? Right. Yes. Yeah. You really aren't going to be doing the modeling yourself in this. Um, so I would recommend, I mean, Really something like Blender is, is a great resource, but there are lots of other um, modeling software as well. If you if you have very little modeling experience, I would recommend using Tinkercad, um, which is super simple to use to get started with, very user-friendly for beginners, and it natively will export as the GLTF file that you need to be able to do this. So yeah, you can very easily create something in Tinkercad, export it, and then upload it to here. Um, Particularly for creating things like avatars, I think probably Tinkercad would be would be pretty good to create little little cartoon characters and stuff like that. You can also add in in gifs as well. So. Yeah, in terms of the images, it'll take all of, you know, basically the standard image file format. So um, <clears throat> PNG, JPEG, GIF. There you go. Yeah, so let's actually like let's publish this. So now it's being uploaded. You can go to view your scene. And so now what you would do is you would create a room with this scene. So, you know, just kind of put it in other terms. You can think of, if you think about it in terms of something like cars, the scene is sort of like the model of the car. So it's like, you know, 2015 Honda Civic, right? Mm -hmm. And and then once you have that model, then you can create 100,000 cars that are that particular model of car, right? And then someone purchases it and then it's that's their particular 2015 Honda Civic. And so that's what a room would be. And so, um, you know, I could just share this with the chat. Oh, I see. And this is the scene. So people can just jump in and you can share the link and people will be immediately able to join.
And again, it will stay this room, this specific room will persist for as long as um, as long as the administrator keeps it open. <clears throat> so everybody can leave and it will still technically be open. Other people can jump in. Um, you can also generate, you can share the link with people. You can create invitations. And then if for some reason someone is no longer invited, you have the ability to uninvite them. Um, so that can be handy if, you know, if you have like a Zoom bombing type situation and someone comes in who uh, maybe came under in under false pretenses and you want to kick them out, you can easily revoke their, their invitation to the room. <clears throat> Um, and then as a user in the scene, you have all of these different functions you can um, see. So individual users can actually share their own screens, which now looks really weird because it's <laughs> seen within a scene here, but you know, people can add their own content in very easily. Um, you can also add in a camera as well. All right. Um, you can also share the link out to people as well. If you're using VR headsets, this is probably the best way to do that with this uh, this code here, which makes it a lot easier than trying to type this link into the, the VR headset. Um, people will also be able to, to draw as well if they want. And then let me also show you how to do custom avatars. So when you go into the avatar selection screen, so you say set name and avatar. If you go here to browse avatars, you have a whole bunch of different avatars you can choose from, pages and pages of different options. Um, but you can also create your own. So when you go into create your own, um, you can go into you can do several things. One is you can take an existing um, model and you can actually change the mess the the texture on it. So that uses another. So there's really three pieces of software. There's there's hubs, there's spoke for creating the different rooms, and then there's quilt, which is used for changing the textures on on the avatars. So if you go into Can you see quilt on that? I'm not sure what's actually being shared right now. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> if you go into quilt, you can basically make any of the changes to the, the texture here for the model and then save those and it will apply to the model. Um, but if you wanted to do your own custom model, you go here to custom GLB and then select it from wherever you have it and then upload it. And then if you allow remixing, here, then that will be a way for your users to be able to access that that avatar as well. Um, you know, so like, let's just say if you're doing this for a classroom and or like a history classroom or something like that, and you wanted people to be able to, you know, if you create a special Benjamin Franklin avatar or something like that, <clears throat> you could just upload it this way and then have people do it. Unfortunately, there is no way to do that from within Spoke. I imagine that's something they will probably implement at some point. So that way the avatars are directly tied to the scene and not to this specific room instance. But at this point, it kind of has to be tied to the, the room instance rather than the scene. Um, but yeah, so once you do that, you can you can create as many of these different avatars as you want. You can give people the option to to select those avatars if you want people to be using your particular theme in this environment. Um, there are also instructions that I included in the documentation, which 
there might be instances if you're doing, for example, a play or something like that, and you want only specific people to be able to access certain avatars, there are there is a way to create a sort of a dressing room that will allow people to put on their costume and then come back into the main room. And only the people who have access to that dressing room will be able to change into those avatars. So that is an option you can use as well if, if you think you'd be doing something like a play or something where you only want certain people to be wearing certain costumes. Um, Any, any questions about the avatars? I was a little bit behind. I didn't see how you got to this part, how you navigated to this. Okay, sure. So <clears throat> if you go up here to the top left, click set name and avatar. This is where you'll be able to change the name of your character. And then um, you would click on browse avatars in the middle here. And then you can choose from any of the ones that they have, or you can go to create avatar and then create your own. Um, some of this stuff is a little bit more complex. So for example, they have different maps. So these are different te textures that you can apply. Um, <clears throat> so so yeah, you have this ability as well. If you have, if you have a, you know, if you created something like Photoshop or something that you want to apply to the model, you can upload these as well. Um, they can also have a normal map on them, which a normal map, basically a normal map is used for adding additional detail without making the geometry more complex. So if you wanted to have smoother edges and things like that, you'd use a normal map. It's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about here, but if you know a little bit more about 3D modeling, that's something that might make sense to you. <clears throat> Oh, uh, one other thing I also want to show. So I'm going to close out of this from here. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think I, I think I skipped over this. So a box collider, essentially what a box collider is, is it's just, it has no geometry with to it whatsoever, really. It is basically just empty space, but it is empty space that, and that if a person cannot walk into. So it's a way to create, um, so normally any of these, these 3D objects are going to have a collider on them, but the box collider option here is just it's only the collider. There is no geometry here whatsoever. So you can use this if you wanted to create invisible walls or something where you wanted to section off certain places that you didn't want people to be, go to, you'd do something like that. Um, another po possible application for it is, let's just say you're creating um, a 3D space where there's maybe three or four different levels, three, you know, sort of multiple floors that you're, you have and you have balconies or something like that and you don't want people just <laughs> jumping off the balconies or whatever, you can use box colliders to make sure that they, when they, if they try to jump off the balcony, they'll just kind of bounce off the, the invisible wall and land back on the floor. Um, so those can be really useful. Um, I actually, to give you an example, we did at Barnard a couple months ago, a, uh, a gallery event. And so in that case, I didn't really want to have to create a model entirely from scratch. So I just used something that was already available in Spoke. But the problem with that model was that there were two floors and there was a staircase going up to the second floor. And I didn't really want people wandering around in, in the second floor because we didn't need that space. So what I did was I just added a box collider across that doorway. So if people went up the stairs, they would eventually just run into this invisible wall that they couldn't go past. Um, 
Unfortunately, in that case, I <laughs> I missed a spot and someone managed to get stuck in there. So they had to log out and log back in again because they couldn't figure out how to get out of there. But um, but yeah, you can use box colliders to, to section off parts of the, the map from other, you know, from, from people. So they can't just wander wherever they want. <clears throat> So any other questions or is there anything you wanted to me to go back to or discuss more in depth? I'm curious about real life um, performance and your experience with groups of people of up, you said, I think you said up to 20. And I'm very curious to know what it's like when you actually have 10, 15 people in the space with the, you, you talked about the dynamic sounds, what if there's any video in the space or any animation? Um, yeah, I'm curious to know how well that works. We've used it a couple times with the games research lab at Teachers College. And um, so usually those were not big groups. Those were maybe 10 people at the most. Um, and it worked pretty well. And um, it's also possible Two, if you have a room created for the room host to change the scene. So you can, you know, so I, when we had our one session, we were like sitting on a tropical island and then we switched over to a space station and then we switched to a train and all these different things. Um, actually, the train one was interesting because what they did in the train one was uh, it felt like we were on a moving train because they took um, video of a moving, you know, moving train car window, and they just applied it at each of the train car windows. So that way it created a sense of motion, even though the scene itself actually wasn't moving. It was pretty, pretty cool effect. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and in those cases, we just were able to throw our own object, objects into the room. Um, we were able to, you know, share video and, and share our screens and stuff like that. So uh, that was mostly just kind of playing around with the technology, seeing what it could do. Um, the audio fall off works pretty well, I would say. So, but you're going to have to just, you know, I did hear one person saying that they felt one of the spaces that they used was too small and that they, they ended up in a situation where the fall off was too small. So it was a situation where people would be standing, you know, six feet away from somebody else and they wouldn't be able to hear them. But then if they were standing, you know, five and a half feet away from them, then they were too loud. So sometimes you have to play a little bit around with that type of stuff. It's, it's a, you know, it's more of an art than a science, I would say in terms of, in terms of that it requires a lot of tweaking before you get it just right. <clears throat> um, in terms of the gallery that we did at Barnard, that one, we weren't really using the audio as much. So everyone was on actually on Zoom and also using um, hubs at the same time. So we, everybody kind of muted their mics but we did have a bunch of um, audio sections. So the exhibit had pieces of video, but then it also had uh, sound portions as well, whether it be a narrator. And so I went in and set, you know, the appropriate fall offs for that. So I made it so that you would go on to the next piece in the exhibit and you would no longer hear the narrator from the previous piece. And so it was just kind of figuring out what that, that range was going to look like. <clears throat> And this is an evolving piece of software as well. So, you know, even just in the last few months, they've added a whole bunch of new features. And so that will continue to be true moving forward. I personally would like to see more interactability. So if I could create little scripts to be able to have be, people be able to interact with objects in the environment in a bit more of a compelling way, I would, I would definitely like that. That's not there right now, but um, I think they will definitely be adding stuff like that in the future.
Um, it would be nice if they, uh, one of the things I would like they would, them to do moving forward is to add some sort of a sphere that shows you what the current audio distance is. That would be pretty nice. Um, there's a bunch of game engines that already have that ability. If you add an, an audio object into the scene, it'll show you how far that sound is going to play for. So something like that would be nice here. Because right now you're only going based off of off of the properties panel and you know max distance 10,000 meters. That's not really clear to me exactly how far that is, <laughs> you know, in this context. <clears throat> what about as a as a moderator? Is there a way to get kind of a lay of the land, seeing where people are, like a general map of the space? How do you? Uh, see what's happening overall if you're if you're if you're moderating some kind of events um there isn't yeah there isn't like anything like a, a map that'll show you where everyone is currently positioned that might be something that would definitely be worthwhile as well um that's actually oh this is actually let me actually show you the this was the Barnard event that we did. So this is the lobby area that we created. And so we were able to add these nice little interfaces that easily showed people how to use the software. And because people can't interact with the objects, it has this little rotating um, setup here. So that way it'll just automatically show you the next step in terms of how to use stuff. So when people logged on originally, they would come into this lobby room here, and then they would go over to this, which would then take them to the gallery section. Yeah, so we put we basically created some image files and then put those on the the wall here. Let me close out a spoke here. We also put these little arrow things on the floor so people would know where to go. We did add these QR codes as well for people. Um, that's obviously only going to really work if people are on desktop, because if they're on mobile, they're not going to be able to take a picture of the QR code with, with the device that they're using to view this on. Um, so keep that in mind, too. Some of these background sounds should not be playing as early as they are. Should really only, this should only be playing at this particular point. I'm not exactly sure why it's playing now. but. Yeah, so these were some of the, the the images the students created. And this is the second floor when we added a little QR code as a kind of an Easter egg if people happen to look up. <clears throat> so this is the stairway that I added the, um, the box collider for. So they would not be able to access this room. You see, I'm trying to get in there, but I can't because there's a box collider in the way. <clears throat> um, this would then take you back to the, the, the main lobby if you were to click on that. Hmm. 
I'm sorry if you explained this before, but as you are developing this, is there, when you're in Spoke, is there a preview mode where you can navigate around your environment? Or is the, is the only way to publish it to hubs and then view? Yeah, you pretty much just publish it and then uh, go into hubs. <clears throat> Is the only way to add text then through basically creating an image of the text and then uploading it? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, there might be something they add in future versions where you can just directly type in something, but <clears throat> otherwise it's pretty much just using images. Okay, yeah, I wasn't actually the administrator for that other room. So, <clears throat> so if you are administrator of the room, then you get these additional features for modifying the room. So you can choose a different scene. So this will keep the same room. It'll just change the, the scenery that's in the room if you, if you choose that. Um, room settings, so this will change the room name. Um, this will change how you want people to access the room. You can also add in a hard cap on how many people can come in. Um, you can also set the permissions for the room members. So if you want people to be able to make their own objects, you can check that box there. You can also check off which type of objects you want them to be able to create. So if you don't want them to be able to you know, share cameras and stuff like that, you can check off that option. Um, you can check off whether or not you want them to be able to create drawings. Um, you can check off whether you want them to be able to, to put emojis into the scene. Um, flying, yeah, it's basically you can sort of fly around the room. You can decide if you want people to do that. So you've got a, a fair amount of control in terms of what um, the room members are gonna be able to do. Yeah, so up here you can, this is where users are gonna be able to add in their own content into the scenes. And then this plus sign down below will actually go one step further and actually allow people to upload stuff that isn't so if you just if you just click on this magic wand tool here, this will be stuff that's already in existing libraries. Whereas if they click this plus sign down here at the bottom, they'll actually be able to upload their own content, so their own videos and images and things like that. So <clears throat> and they can also post URLs to things like that as well. Yeah, so if you turn off all those permissions, only you as the administrator of the room will be able to do those things, but otherwise everyone will be able to. <clears throat> um, oh, also this up here at the top right tells you how many different objects, new objects have been added to the room. So that can kind of give you an idea of kind of how crazy things are starting to get. So if you see there's like 30, 40 objects in the room, that might be start to become a problem. Um, so you can actually just start junking stuff <clears throat> so we go up here to say, you know what, get rid of all that. <clears throat> and now I'm back down to zero new objects in the room. Which is pretty handy if you're, <laughs> if you're working with students and they start to get a little crazy and just start dragging and dropping absolutely everything they can think of into the room. Uh, it's also, this is also very handy if 
you know, as you're saying before, you know, having a, a map of where everything is, this is a convenient way to show you, you know, what is currently in the scene, even if it's not something that is immediately visible to you. <clears throat> And this will also show you the different users that are in the room. Um, it will not, I don't think it will show you their location, but it will show you um, who's currently on. And um, I, I guess it, as an administrator, you can also change their avatar and their name. So if for some reason they choose an avatar or a name that you don't think is appropriate, you have some ability to control that. Um, you can also mute everyone as well if there's just too many people talking and you want to have uh, control of the room, you can also hit that mute all button and then only you will be heard. So now I change the scene in the room, it's still the same room. If you have 25 people in here, they'll all still be in, or you know, 24 people in this room, they'll all still be in this room. You just will now have changed the scene. Um, and all of the media content that they may have brought into the room will all still be here as well. It'll just drop it into various spots wherever there happens to be free space. <clears throat> Yeah, can you actually hear the the background noise in this room or no okay so yeah so the room i guess that doesn't get shared with the screen sharing but there's like crickets and uh wind blowing and stuff like that so you can create all sorts of interesting ambiance <clears throat> Um, and then whenever you're done with the room, you can just do close room. This will shut down the room entirely. The link will no longer work for that room. Um, and so it's basically just gone. So the scene, if, if you have created a scene, the scene will still continue to exist even if you shut down the room. Um, but this particular instance of that scene will no longer exist. <clears throat> <clears throat> so to be clear, the what you're publishing to hubs is the scene you have a project yes you spoke, yeah you publish in a scene and then the scene can be used to create a room correct? right exactly yep and how would you go how would you get to your so i've published a scene how do i go and delete it if i don't know the one make it available is that uh it's not so, at all. so the scene is going to be controlled from from inside spoke. So if you go um, hubs.mozilla.com slash spoke, and then you have a list of all of your projects here, you can just go and delete the project and it's just gone. Um, that deletes the project or that deletes the scenes that was published from the project? Oh, both. Uh, both, yeah, basically. Okay. So that <clears throat> they should maybe standardize the, some of the terminology there. But yeah, so basically, if you just don't want that that scene in existence anymore, that's how you would get rid of it. <clears throat> Thank you. 
So once it's published, it's published. So there's no going back, basically. <laughs> Right Unless you delete the problem. Yeah, you can you can delete it after the fact. Yeah, that's that's um, yeah. These are the projects here that that I've created, some of which may be published. I can then just go and delete the project, and it's gone. Yeah, so here you have the classroom example. <clears throat> so each one of the different seats has its own waypoint that then students can then sit into. Uh, this also will toggle the, the grid. If you have the grid turned on, you can toggle that on and off. Um, you can also set <clears throat> you can also set where um, so the grid actually doesn't really do anything. It's just purely for um, kind of your own <clears throat> visualizing purposes. And you can also change the size of the grid up grid squares as well. <clears throat> using that. It will not, the grid will not appear in the scene when you actually publish it. It's just there for construction purposes. Um, this, so this also is something you might find useful. This is a snap tool. So this will determine um, you know, if objects, if, if you turn the snap off, um, you'll have complete and free control over the movement of the objects. If you turn the snap on, it will sort of jump to whatever the nearest object is. So maybe, you know, for that that um, example before with the particle emitter that you're trying to get it to work, that might be a way to get it to align a little more easily. <clears throat> oh, there's a whole other room here. Yeah, so this is a very, very detailed uh, world. This one might have some issues with performance if you had people using lower end, um, <clears throat> like mobile or something like that, it might start to cause problems. So do you guys have any ideas on how you might utilize something like this? Well, for me, I'm part of a team that's uh, gone virtual, of course, recently, and mm -hmm. is planning to stay virtual to an extent and people miss a sense of connection. So we've thought about finding a way to, to, to recreate some of our old spaces that we used to meet in. That's, uh, that's the number one idea that we have. I know that NYU used uh, Mozilla Hubs to create a graduation sort of celebration area for last May because they obviously couldn't have any in-person events. And so they created sort of like these game rooms and, and stuff like that and socializing rooms, place for people to meet. And then obviously Teachers College, you know, we have our space now that we're using for that. 
Um, we haven't really used it for actual classes. It's mostly just people decide they want to go in and, and hang out there. They have that available to them. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty much all the, the content that I have to share with you guys. Um, if you have any last questions, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, I guess we can, we can probably close up. Can I ask a question on the sure. buck flyer? See if I just to see if I get it right. So I was, um, you know, trying to build walls around a space. Mm -hmm. I think you were describing. So I've got four box collider walls, but, mm -hmm. but I seem to be able to get through. Is there, um, is there a you, property that I need to? So you, maybe just so, you so were you doing this in spoke, or you're saying you published it and then went into a room and couldn't, and were still able to walk through? Um, well, I could show you if you want. I could. Sure. It's, uh... So I've got, I took one of the objects and, and I've got a ground plane and then I've got these four mm -hmm. walls, but I can back up and move away from the scene. It looks like when I'm in the the actual world, I can, uh, yeah, I can, I can zoom out to infinity. <laughs> so I'm not sure. There's so did you create this room after you created the walls or did you do it before? Meaning? So, because it doesn't, oh, it doesn't actually first, or yeah, 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 because yeah. it's not going to update in real time. You have to publish it and then open the room up. So the pro yeah. that should it should work then. I'm pretty sure the one there first, but I could I could definitely try again. So is that so? So it's not live from the project, right? And um, right, so it's not live. Got it. Yeah, I could try that. Thank you. I, I can stop sharing. Do you get any, um, like I'm thinking of potential to use this for, uh, actually, I think at Teachers College, there was um, they're, they use the, um, the, the, what is it called? The theater in the, the Smith Theater, the Smith Learning Theater uh, to do tracking of participants and events for, um, uh, for a social psychology studies. And so I'm wondering if, if um, do you get any stats in this environment about what your users are doing where you could analyze behavior of people clustering together or staying away from each other or anything like that? Is that is that a feature of this system? Um, no, no. There's really not a way to to track uh, people's movement inside of it. It's a place um, to meet. That's what it is. <laughs> also, I realized that I was um, accidentally sending sending the messages in chat only to Victor. So that's why you didn't see, I talked about the presentation and you didn't get the link. So I just sent the link now. Um, that was my mistake there. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I think it's requesting or we have to request access though. So can I just request that and then you'll like. Sure, yeah. Okay, thanks.
Okay, should be set now. Did you get it working? Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so that also has the link to the teacher's college room if you wanted to see what that like as well. <clears throat> and that I believe, I don't know if you use the architectural kit for that one. Um, I think he did use, using uh, a modular system though, so. I have to head out, but thank you so much. It's been mm -hmm. really helpful and very cool. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you. This was very interesting and great introduction. So thank you for your time, really. And thanks for sending the link. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.